Peace, power, and love. What's going on? It's your one and only Kansu Shesh Muhammad. Team Osiris. What's going on, everybody out there? We got a special, special um, show tonight. We're actually going to be speaking on a topic that's pretty popular um, and pretty interesting. To me, it's kind of logical. I don't understand how this has gotten to a point where everybody is talking about this. And what I'm talking about is flat earth. Yes, flat earth. And flat earth, <laughs> people are trying to people are trying to debunk the fact that the earth is round. I really don't understand it. At, at this point, I think we need to kind of get this out of the way. So Team Osiris is going to debunk the flat earth theory. And we're going to try to do it empirically and give you something to give a discussion about. So we're definitely going to try to do that. So let, let's let's try to get this started. You know, we got members from Team Osiris that have done a phenomenal job in putting this information together. I'm going to give some insight on it. Really give the basis of how this argument can be handled. That's the most important thing is <clears throat> we stay within context of the argument. That's really the most important thing. So, you know, let's let's. Let's get this ball rolling. So we're going to debunk, you know, Team Osiris is going to debunk the flat earth theory. And, and before we move forward, I want to kind of introduce some things. The major thing that I want to introduce is scientific method. It takes a scientific method to debunk a scientific method. So if someone says the, the earth is flat, then you need to show me the science behind it. Because we're talking about the earth. And we're talking about the properties of the earth. So we're getting into ecology, geology, astronomy. We're getting into these aspects of science and physics. So because we're getting into that aspect, we really have to pay attention to the fact that it needs to be a scientific method. So I need to see, Timo Cyrus, we need to see the scientific method behind the flat earth theory. And see if it holds merit. And see if it's been proven. Instead of it's been claimed or it being a theory, has it's been has it been proven? That's the most important thing. So th these are some facets that I look at. One, you have to ask a question when you start a scientific theory. You want to ask a question. Then you want to do background research. Okay, and after you do the background research, you actually want to construct a hypothesis. Now, when you construct that hypothesis, you want to test with an experiment. And after you test with an experiment, you want to get a procedure working. Now, when this procedure gets working, there's two things that happen. Does it work or it does work? That's a no or a yes. Now, let's say it doesn't work after you follow these steps. Well, then you want to troubleshoot the procedure. You actually want to carefully check um, all steps and, all, and how you set everything up. But let's say you get a yes. Well, then you want that's experimental data. And you know, with that experimental data, then you can it becomes background uh, research for future um, development in the project. Um, and you can ask new questions from that. Um, and you can actually get your your hypothesis experiment, um, experimented on a higher level. You can go deeper into that. Now, after you go through the procedure and its workings, you want to analyze the data and draw conclusions from that data. And that means that your results got to align with the hypothesis. hypothesis. And furthermore, um, the results uh, also have to align with uh, particularly not all of the hypothesis. It might not be all of it. Because if it did answer your questions, as you do more background research, the development may change. Okay, so if the development changes, that, that can actually either help your theory or either make your theory more concise. So at the end, you will actually want to um, communicate all results. And then you communicate those results to, um, to, to actually showing, well, this is a valid procedure. And if it's a valid procedure, then we can move forward. And I can actually deem it a scientific fact. Now, with that being said and being understood, one of the things that we're going to do now is go into the quantum aspects of the flat earth theory. We're going to start dealing with some of the constructs in it. And that being said, I'm, I, we're going to have an overview to the flat earth myth. We actually believe it's a myth and we're going to deem it that. 
So I'm going to actually release the floor to the brother Heru from Team Osiris. And I'm sure he's going to eloquently break that down. So brother Heru, you have the floor. Peace, peace. <laughs> can I be heard? You may sound here clearly. Yes, you can. All right. Um, this is the brother Kans who stated uh, recently the flat earth theory is uh, starting to gain a little notoriety. Um, you know, it's something that we thought would have been done a long time ago, but, you know, it reared its ugly head again. And, um, we felt like this would be a topic for us to go ahead and uh, talk about. Um, there was one group in particular, uh, the Flat Earth Society, that has gained, that has gained a significant following. As it stands right now, the Flat Earth Society official Facebook page is at 62,000 plus likes, 11,000 followers on Twitter, and millions of views on YouTube. Although this may not seem like a lot to the average person, when given the understanding of how many people it is in this world, um, this movement has picked up some steam and it's starting to become a thorn in the side of uh, scientists and some scientific enthusiasts such as myself. Um, I like to show, well I should say, we like to show how the earth isn't flat and we'll cover some key points to corroborate why that myth is not true. Um, it's been known for thousands of years that the earth isn't flat. I'll begin with Erastos of Cyrene. He was a Greek polymath. He was known for his capacity to learn and he covered a wide range of subjects including math, geography, poetry, and astronomy, just to name a few. Although well learned, the reason I start with him is because he was the first person known to calculate the circumference of the earth and the tilt of the earth's axis. For someone almost 2,300 years ago, this is a remarkable feat by someone according to today. <laughs> the method by which he did this with, with no modern GPS and no mechanical technology was quite simple and not very complex. He was able to observe the position of the sun at certain times of the day in two areas in Egypt, in Cyrene, which is today known as Aswan. During the summer solstice, he noticed that by looking down a water well and knowing a person's body will block the reflection of the sun on the water. And then he made the same observation in Alexandria at noon. Aswan and Alexandria are approximately 800 kilometers apart from each other, which is around 500 miles. So if the earth was indeed flat, then he should have come to the same conclusion in both areas at the same time of the day, but he didn't. What he did was create a scale model of the triangle, which is Aswan, Alexandria, and the shadow of the sun that he observed. And that measurement turned out to be seven degrees or one fiftieth the way around of a circle. So in his conclusion, he concluded that the earth is spherical and the earth must be 50 times his original or his, his original measurement, which by today that turned out to be quite accurate. All right, then uh, that that's it for my uh, portion. I'm uh, pass it over to uh, Brother Melvin to go ahead and uh, hit his portion of. All right, um, I'm dealing with some of the theories that are out there. Uh, a lot of people are making a lot of claims. Uh, sometimes you don't know necessarily whether it's true or not. So I'm here to show you some of the claims that are made, and you know we also show some logic on you know how to use scientific method to validate those claims or not. Uh, so first up is ancient theories. A lot of people like to say because folks did it so many odd years ago that it actually still counts. Um, first up was the Babylonians. Uh, they thought that the earth was hollow and flat to provide space for the underworld. According to them, um, I did use plate six from the Fermata Earth and Sea uh, you can pick that up from the Cosmographia Universalis. Uh, it's a, a, a Babylonian cosmology, and they actually talk about that as well as they have an image about that there as well. Um, also, one of the popular ones are the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians thought the Earth was a square, you know, it had four corners, and that the mountains were supporting uh, the vault of the sky, or supporting the, the dome top of the sky. Uh, we also thought on neither of those to be true. Um, uh, both of them got that from Mesopotamia. Uh, I have an excerpt I'm going to read really quickly uh, talking about the Mesopotamian uh, myth. It says, unpredictable 
and dangerous waters played a prominent role in Mesopotamian cosmology. As might be expected, in an area subject to unpredictable flooding, early Mesopotamian myths described the earth and heavens as flat disks supported by water. Somewhat later, the heavens were described as hemispheric, hemispherical vault, which rested on the waters and surrounded the earth. The heavenly bodies were gods who dwelt beyond the waters, above the heavens, and came out of their dwelling places for their daily journey through the heavens. Since the gods controlled the events on earth, their motions of the heavenly bodies were closely studied to reveal the intentions and designs of the gods. And I got that from a book, text called A History of the Life Sciences of the Revised, Expanded, and Third Edition. And on the sixth page, it breaks down uh, Mesopotamian and Egyptian cosmology on how, how Earth began and how the Earth starts. And so that's my touch on ancient theories. Um, if you was listening while I you know, read that last piece, that sounds awfully similar to the Bible on how it's saying that there's two uh, waters, one above the Earth and one below the Earth or on the Earth. And so you know, that's a great way to say very right into some of the biblical theories that you hear out there. I do have some scriptures uh, to back these up. Uh, feel free to read them at Star Leisure, Leisure, because it's a lot of them. Um, and we're going to start, first of all, the, the, the Christian church accepted uh, Aristotle's spherical earth uh, theory at first, but um, once certain members of the church uh, politically started pointing out that the Bible mentions the four corners of the earth, they immediately uh, discarded Aristotle's uh, spherical earth theory. Uh, and even today, uh, flat earthers, modern flat earthers, and sometimes some Hebrews uh, love to use that, you know, the Bible was a flat earther, still from a flat earther's uh, perspective or agenda. And, and I verified that with these scriptures. Uh, in Genesis 1, 6 and 8, and Genesis 1, 17, the earth is covered by a vault, or as one known as a firmament, and that the celestial bodies of the angels move inside the firmament. So similar to the Babylon uh, of the Mesopotamian cosmos, uh, in uh, Joshua 10 verse 12, the Hebrews considered the sun and moon to be small bodies near the earth. In Isaiah 40, 22, uh, God sits on the circle or firmament of the earth. And, and I'll explain what circle means in the next one. It's the same uh, translation uh, either fires uh, from Job 22 and 14, either fires the Temanite, says God walks on the circuit of the earth. And the word circuit here means in circular motion, like walking or driving in circles. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a sphere, it's just saying that it's a circular motion or a circular disk. Again, this is supporting the flat earth theory, or at least this is what they say is supporting the theory. And the last of the Old Testament is Daniel chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Daniel's vision was a great tree, and that tree could be seen across the entire earth. Uh, also, as the days from the New Testament, uh, where Satan took Jesus up on that high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world, uh, by doing that, one would assume that if he could see all of the kingdoms of the world on a high mountain, you would assume that the earth was flat. So that it would be accessible for him to see that. Uh, also in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1, uh, if you read a verse, I mean, if you read in chapter 2 or is it chapter 1, where John says he was in the spirit and he saw, saw a lot of things. And when you get to chapter 7 verse 1, one of the things he saw was four angels. And those four angels stood at the four corners of the earth. And each one was holding one of the four winds of the earth. Uh, and so if you look at the next point I have, there's this notions of waters above and below, like I mentioned earlier, we first mentioned in the Babylonian text, they believe that the waters were divided, some remain above the dome, which is the firmament, and when it rained, you know, when that dome leaked, it, that's when they said it was raining, and then the waters rested below that dome. And a lot of biblical creationists out there agree that water above the firmament or above the dome actually 
uh, was the source of the original flood. We all know is Noah's flood. Um, so they like to use that idea. Uh, I've come to find out that a lot of flat earthers are primarily biblical literalists, which means that they read the text as is for its literal meaning. And uh, I'll go into just a little bit more about some other flat earth theories. Uh, there are plenty of flat earth theories, or theorists. Uh, Brother Heru mentioned um, the uh, Flat Earth Society, but the Flat Earth Society wasn't always you know, by that name. They've always been in, in existence since the 18th century. And they used to go by the name the Zetetic Society, the Zetetic Society. And then they developed into the Universal Zetetic Society, uh, with the leader there being Samuel Rowe Botham. And then uh, years later, Samuel Shenton took over, and he named it the International Flat Earth Society. They have a lot of members in there, so it's a lot of it's a small group of people that support it. Uh, most flat earthers believe that water surface is flat, and so because they believe that, they, they assume that the earth is also flat. Um, a lot of times they say that pictures from Earth are fabricated. They were made in a movie theater with a camera and, and a paper mold and things like that. They don't believe that you know pictures that NASA took were real. A lot of people think that sailing on a ship or boat meant that that boat or that ship went in a straight motion. They're, they're saying that if the Earth was curved, uh, it wouldn't be in a straight motion. It would have to go in circular motion. Now that's illogical if you know how ships work and you know how sailing seas work. Mm -hmm. But according to them, that's that's a, a to their liberty perception, that's a, 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 an angle against flat earth theory. Uh, also, they say that uh, because the stars don't move, the earth has to be flat. But uh, you can take time last recordings over so many periods of time and you can actually show stars moving across the uh, north axis of the Earth. Uh, if you, you look up stellar parallax, stellar parallax calculates the distances from different stars to the Earth using trigonometry. And stellar parallax shows you that not only do these stars move, but they also move in a circular motion around the Earth. Uh, some things that they also believe is that common sense supersede science. Uh, and they say science is strictly metaphorical, mystical, and mythical. So again, you have people who disregard the scientific method, and upon disregarding with it, they try to in include their own theory or their own method without using the scientific method. And that's where you're going to find flaw in a lot of their arguments. And lastly, uh, before I pass up, uh, Mike, uh, there also claims that because the horizon, when you view the horizon, uh, in the sky, that the horizon is flat. Wherever you go, even if you climb up a very, very tall building, you said that the horizon is still flat. Or at least it appears to be that way. But if you take images of space, those prove otherwise. You can actually see the horizon as a curve to it uh, from those space images. People say that those images are fake, uh, but you know, you can also look at how ships and buildings disappear if you're on a sea level. If you, uh, you get on a boat or a ship and you sail away, you notice that other ships and other buildings start uh, minimizing. They get smaller as you get further away from the sea level. And that verifies that the Earth is round. And that's my piece. Man, powerful, powerful uh, information, brother. That was definitely some concise information to get a, a really clear, in-depth understanding of the flat earth perspective and what actually gives the flat earth um, <clears throat> aficionados their claim. But what I will do is segue into a brother, uh, Joseph, who is a part of Team Osiris, and he's going to talk about the moon faces. Brother Joseph, uh, you have the floor, brother. Peace, peace, family. Brother Joseph. And yeah, now let's get into this real quick about the lunar eclipses and phases. And first, I wanted to go into what is actually a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse is when the Earth passes in between the sun and our moon and casts a shadow over the lunar surface. If you look closely, you can pick out a slight curvature on that <clears throat> when you look at that. And as you can see in the diagram shown above, 
Also, if the earth were flat, there would there would be some people who occasionally see a straight line pro projected on the moon. Hold on a second. All right. Hold on a second. Also, Aristotle, um, who made quite observations about the spherical nature of the earth, noticed that during lunar eclipses, when the earth's orbit places it directly places it directly between the sun and the moon, creating a shadow in the process. The shadow of the moon's surface is round. This shadow is the earth, and it's great a great clue on the spherical shape of the earth. So as you can see in that um, diagram shown. Wait a minute, stop it. All right. And I also wanted to give people a, a observation that they can make with their kids. Well, we place the two sticks on the ground on a sunny day and then measure the length of the shadow. At the same time, you can call a friend who is at least a few miles away from you and tell them to do the same. The lengths you measure will be different. The curvature of a spherical Earth means that the sun rays will hit the, each stick differently if they are far enough apart. And that's on um, shadows. And that's it. Man, that's that's and one thing I, I like about that, brother Joseph, is the fact that you gave a working model. A, a working um, representation of how one can validate the curvature of the earth. And I, I question if flat earthers can do that. Um, they haven't been able to do it yet. And that's really um, a, a, a serious, serious caveat in the flat earth claim. Um, what I want to do now is get into the Coralist effect, which is the sniper's uh, equation. And I want to hand the, this, uh, this information over to uh, Brother Menace, who is another member of Team Osiris, and let him really get into the quantum aspects of the coalition effect. So, Brother Menace, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Brother. But, uh, Brother Haru, um, could you uh, please say way into uh, my part so I can um, uh, um, on death? All right. Now, uh, before we get into the Coriolis effect itself, um, we're going to give a bit of a background on what that is. Um, in the field of physics, in 1835, French mathematical engineer scientist Gaspard Gustave de Coriolis published a paper describing the energy wheels of machines with moving parts. In this paper, he expounded on the concept that was formerly done by Italian scientist Giovanni Riccoli and his assistant Frances uh, Francesco Maria Grimaldi in 1651, where they concluded that a cannonball fired from from the north should deflect east in accordance with the Earth's rotation. And what will later become known as the Coriolis effect, uh, it was called the compound centri centrifugal force uh, by Coriolis. And uh, Brother Meech is going to go into more detail on uh, the people that discovered it and what it actually is. Yeah. Right, go ahead, Meech. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you, brother. Um, yeah, this is uh, Brother Minis Meets Mayata. Team Osiris is on the horizon. Kim Shed Kim. Uh, I'll go further into the Coralis effect and, uh, and speak more on the history as well as the mathematics and how it's used in modern day. Okay, the uh, Coralis effect, uh, the sniper's equation. On Earth's surface, projectiles and bodies and free fall appear to be deflected by the Earth's rotation in physics. It's called the Coriolis effect. This is apparent in deflection of moving objects when the motion is described relative to a rotating uh, reference frame. And this reference frame that we use is the Earth. In a reference frame with a clockwise rotation, the deflection is to the left of the motion of the object like in the northern hemisphere. Um, if you look at the uh, far right of my slide uh, where it says cor uh, Coralis uh, force, you can see um, the northern hemisphere and going to the left. 
and um, and the other one, uh, which is counterclockwise rotation, um, in the northern hemisphere, I mean, uh, in the southern hemisphere, uh, the deflection is to the right, as you can also see in the far left of the slide. Although recognized previously by others like uh, Jesuit astronomer, astronomer uh, Giovanni Battista Coli, uh, who lived from 1598 to 1671, who studied fallen bodies and produced the first precise measurement of G, or geocentrics, foresaw the effect, described it at, in his, <coughs> describe, excuse me, described it in his 1651, Algor Novum, uh, that was the book that he wrote, as an argument against the motion of the Earth. Um, the motion of the Earth argument was from Copernicus, and they was like anti copernicus The effect of non-detection being taken as an indication of Earth's immob immobility. Ricola's description seems to be the earliest description of the effect uh, found so far. Nikolai built his equation off of the foundation of the geoheliocentric theory developed by Tycho Bay, Brady, in which the sun, moon, and stars circled an immobile Earth while the planet circled the sun, a theory uh, compatible with the telescopic devices of the 17th century, which he later disproved in his experimentation using the cannonball to shoot at directional targets. The mathematical expression is uh, F Coriolis, or sometimes you'll see it written as CF, or Coriolis force, um, minus 2M, parentheses, X, VR, close parentheses. Um, I'll tell you what those mean. Uh, an object mass is the M in the equation. Its velocity in rotation frames is the VR in the equation, and the angular velocity of the rotating frame of reference. Um, yeah, that's the part. Of, that's the part of the VR. XVR. Okay, if as you see in the mid screen of the slide, you'll see a um, a, a, a equation uh, that also has a omega sign in it. This is the uh, the extended equation, which is Coriolis force equals 2 omega times V times sin. The sin is the latitude, and the omega is the rotation rate of the Earth, and the V is the velocity of the motion. Of, uh, yeah, the velocity of motion. The Coriolis force appeared in, 1830, in an 1835 paper by French scientist Gaspar. Gustav Corrales, and connection with his study of water wheels. The Corrales effect effect caused by the rotation of Earth and the inertia of mass experienced the effect. Inertia is a resistance of physical objects to any changes in the state of mosaic, uh, 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 excuse me, in the state of motion. Isaac Newton defined inertia as the first law in his philosophy, uh, naturalis, Principle uh, mathematical, or the philosophy of natural principles of mathematics, which states the this ista, which is Latin for the innate force of matter, is a power of resisting by which every body, as much as it lies, endeavors to preserve its present state, whether it be the rest or moving uniformly forward in a straight line. As mentioned earlier, the Coriolis effect causes moving objects on the surface of the Earth to be deflected to the right with respect of the direction of travel. In the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere, the horizontal deflection effect is greater near the poles and smallest at the equator. Since the rate of change of the diameter of circles of latitude when traveling north and south increases closer, uh, the object uh, closer the object is to the poles. So if you look at uh, the upper left corner of the slide, 
you'll see it says or after X summary. Uh, in that summary, you'll see that going towards the north, you have a heightened effect, and going towards the equator is zero. And then uh, you have a heightened left effect when you're going southern uh, of the equator. This effect is of great importance of oceanographers and dealing with ocean currents, meteorologists, and tracking storm travel, and military snipers. Recently, a British military, uh, British military sniper, Corporal Craig Harrison, set a new world record in Afghanistan by dropping a Taliban fighter at this of 100 feet, uh, of plus 100 feet, besting the previous record set eight years ago by Canadian Army sniper Robert Forlong of 1.5 miles, also in Afghanistan. The latest record distance is eight. Uh, 8,120 feet, fired with a 338 Kupa Magnum rifle, while the furlongs was 7,972 feet, fired with a 50 caliber rifle. Harrison's distance reportedly was verified uh, by GPS reading. When shooting beyond a thousand yards, now this is the this is the main point. Because it, you don't have to worry about the Coriolis effect if you're not shooting a distance of a thousand yards. So the highly trained professionals only can make these type of shots. When shooting uh, beyond a thousand yards, long range shooters begin to encounter exotic effects that are not an issue for closer ranges. The more common and best understood is bullet drill. A lot of attention is paid to bullet velocity, but uh, that bullet is also spinning. So at a greater distance, whatever way that, that uh, the barrel is cut, the bullet comes out and it spins in that certain direction. And whatever way that direction that the bullet spins in, that's why you have to know your rifle, that, that bullet will drift at a longer distance to that side. Um, the 338 Lupal Magnum projectile with a muzzle velocity of 2,800 FPS, ex uh, exiting a barrel with a, a, a 1 in 12 rate of twist, is spinning at 100, 168,000 RPM. By the time the bullet has traveled 1,000 yards, that tremendous rotation will cause the bullet to drift slightly in the direction it rotates, roughly one minute of angle. The only way to predict this effect in greater ranges is to either have a test have tested the rifle and is and its load at those distances or to employ a reliable ballistics computer. In most cases, I suspect that snipers make their best guess and, and shoot. Less understood and less predictable is the Coriolis effect. This is not an aerodynamic effect with the slight pull of the Earth's rotation on the bullet, pulling a tiny bit right or left, depending on um, if you're in the northern or southern hemisphere. Seldom considered by riflemen because it's only concerned at extreme ranges. Like I said, you can only, only the greatest or the highly skilled and trained snipers uh, have to worry about this effect. Um, because it's only concerned about stream rate. The devastation varied according to where the shooter is located and the direction is fired. It's greater on the poles and least on the equator. The closer the shooter is to fire directly east and west, he can minimize its impact. However, again, calculating the effect requires a ballistic computer, and I suspect most snipers make their best guess and take the shot. Um, the day may come when all of these factors and considerations are calculated automatically for the shooter, but you know, we, we haven't got there in technology yet. But having seen how much goes into extreme range shots, you would think that uh, most of y'all should share the appreciation of the skill and the knowledge the shooting, of the shooting experience required by today's incredible shooters. Uh, if you look on the lower left corner, you can see a military grade uh, Coriolis correction um, uh, shot chart, 
where it starts at the range of a thousand meters and it goes further. Then when you get to like those deeper meters, uh, like in the slide thousand and above, like a uh, high power uh, 50 cal can only go like around that 5,000 range. After you go past that, you're talking about rail guns and stuff like that that's uh, mounted to ships as well as planes. Uh, but they still themselves have to deal with the Coriolis effect. And uh, that's, that, that should get you all to uh, understand um, how it affects us in modern day and how it helps us protect us at home, you know, because they're out there uh, fighting for our freedoms uh, using this Coriolis effect daily. Thank you. All right, man, that's a lot of details, a lot of uh, information. Uh, those of you that are watching, you're watching Team Osiris. Uh, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to Team Osiris. Also, Team Osiris Rises, our other YouTube channel. And join the notification squad. When you subscribe, click on that bell and save that because you'll be able to get up-to-date information when you get new uploads from Team Osiris. And when we go live to give special presentations, you'll always be on top of all the cutting-edge information surrounding science. So with that being said, make sure you also subscribe to our Team Osiris Facebook page. And that's Team Osiris at Facebook.com. Also, Team on Set, join that as well. And, you know, just become a part of the Team Osiris family. We appreciate science, man, to the fullest. And we believe in empirical sound information from a peripheral perspective. Um, with, that, with that being said as well, I would like to segue into the brother Melvin as he kind of breaks down um, the supporters of round spherical Earth. What supporters do we have when we speak of a round Earth? So, brother Melvin... Team Osiris is on the horizon. You have the floor, brother. Uh, thank you, brother. That was an excellent uh, scientific breakdown by both brother Heru and brother Mendez. Uh, so I do want to start with the supporters. Uh, number one is uh, Aristotle. I did mention him earlier with the Christian Church. Uh, when he brought it up, uh, and he has about four methods uh, that actually proved that there's a spherical Earth. Uh, first, would be the gradual disappearance of ships over the horizon. Uh, we talked about that earlier. The further the ships go up the horizon, the, the less you'll see to the point where the only thing that's left would be the sails of, of the ship until it completely disappears. Uh, his second point was the shape of a curved shadow of the Earth or on the moon during eclipses. Uh, Brother Joseph uh, spoke about that very briefly. Uh, Third was the variation of the sun's elevation with latitude. Uh, this is the basis of Aristotle's measurement. Uh, Brother Hirusta spoke about that earlier, uh, as well as Brother Menez. Uh, and the variation of a star's elevation with latitude, the, the mere fact that you even see a new star as it moves north to south on the Earth's surface validates that that movement is therefore circular, not straightforward. Uh, because of Aristotle's uh, argument, you know, as I told you about the Christian Church accepting it until they got political, but Islam, it, the Islamists believe in a spherical Earth. Now there are some who believe more that it's 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 spherical, but it's not completely round. But for the most part, when Aristotle brought up his argument, they agreed. Uh, there's some mentions that I saw a lot of Tertullian because he had a lot of disagreements with the Greeks, that he disagreed with their idea of a spherical Earth. Uh, but there's no documentation about him saying that. So therefore, we can't take that uh, as valid until we find documentation of Tertullian saying he disagrees uh, with the spherical Earth or that he supports flat Earth theory. Uh, most flat Earthers don't quite understand gravitational force or how that works. So a lot of times when you go into conversations with them, they automatically deny that gravity exists. Uh, one of the examples that I've heard <laughs> for the reason of gravity not existing is because things just fall. They're heavy, they fall, without even explaining why they fall, or what's pulling them down. And so this is, again, people not understanding scientific method. Uh, an easy thing to, to, to determine if the Earth is spherical or it's flat is time zones. Uh, 
uh, most of us on the team, we, we live in different time zones. So, you know, a lot of us are an hour away, some of us are four hours away. Uh, time zones exist. And you know that if you talk to people on other sides of the planet. So, again, if it was a flat earth, there would be no need for a time zone. Uh, also, lunar eclipses, you know, they cast their shadows on the sun and moon. If you had a flat earth, it wouldn't cast a shadow if the earth is between the sun and moon. Now, that was spoken about earlier, also, with Brother Manas. But lastly, I mean, we hear this all the time, nonstop, NASA's lying. NASA puts up a video or a picture of the Earth, and it's, it's, it's spherical. You know, people automatically say it's a conspiracy, NASA's lying. Uh, but the thing we have to understand is that NASA isn't the only ones in space. You also have the Russian Federation and the Chinese that are also in space, uh, as well as a few others, and they all have their own space station. All of it paid for by their own individual nation. So if NASA was lying, that would mean that those others are lying as well. They're lying and they're still keeping, you know, space stations up. They, they're still sending people like yearly and they're paying billions of dollars for the research. If they're lying, that's a waste of a lot of money. So I just want to bring that out, show you that and some supports. Um, you know, these people also take uh, up in space, they take a lot of the same shots that NASA takes, uh, just to verify, you know, each other. So again, you know, these people are lying. That's a lot of money being wasted by multiple nations that probably don't even like themselves to share a mutual agreement that the Earth is round. So that's my piece. Man, that's some powerful information. And you know, this is something that um, I'm glad we could discuss, man. This is some real powerful powerful information and it it, it it kind of speaks to um when we say empirical you know evidence when we talk about people that create conspiracy theories taking things to a point where they just can't be proven and they're left as a conspiracy and we get all of these intricate details that sound very logical but irrational and we tend to, to tend to give it fact of being a theory well, the theory has to have a methodology to it. So it has to be a sound, methodical means of you coming to a conclusion. So what you induce and deduct is very important in your reasoning as you abduct fact from fiction to come to a conclusion. So in saying that, I kind of want to open the floor to the panel. And, you know, my first question always is, is how did this come about? You know, in, in anyone's opinion that's on the panel, how did this come about, man? Uh, are you talking about uh, us doing a particular show or just Flat Earth in general? No, Flat Earth in general. How did this become <clears throat> such a phenomenon and, and, and take on a, a a following, if you want to call it that? I, I, I think I think it's got made a lot to do with religion, you know, particularly like Christianity and Judaism. Since they claim the earth is flat, you know, a lot of people kind of just took that as law, you know? Right. I, I actually agree. Most flat earthers that, you know, I come across and that most people have come across and I talk to, they always say that flat earthers are usually go hand in hand with uh, biblical, you know, religious followers. Uh, fortunately, I haven't found anyone who, who practices Islam that says that the world, that the earth is flat. Most Islamics uh, actually don't even take the time to disagree with that. Uh, but yes, mostly Christians, uh, most most Catholics, which is, you know, can be the same thing. Uh, I think it's mostly just political. Uh, we got to also understand uh, uh, Aristotle wasn't always liked as you know, the books make him say. I think I think it was more political, and then you know him going against the text kind of made him look like a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I say this too um, before I get my opinion on Flat Earth. I, I, I want to give a special shout out to uh, 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 religions and, uh, and um, this going to sound funny coming from me personally, but um, what a lot of people don't understand is a lot of things that we use today have come from religious mind thought. And when I mean use today, as in the good things that we use and the understandings that we have about certain topics came from a religious uh, perspective, uh, especially Islam. Islam played an integral part 
uh, during the rise of Islam and a lot of things that we know today. So, I mean, for everybody that has a problem with Islam, you, you can't get around the fact that Islam was very integral and in, uh, giving us some of our understanding of uh, the various topics. Uh, Christianity too, but Islam uh, 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 for the most part. Uh, but <clears throat> as far as Black Earth go, I think it's just the evolution of, uh, you know, human understanding uh, in general. Uh, understanding where we are, who we are in the universe. I, I, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, at first that, that was always a logical thought that it was flat because, I mean, at what point in time did humans feel like, hey, when are we going to decide, uh, uh, when are we going to quantify what we live on, that we live on, it, it, is it earth round or flat? So, I mean, probably the original philosophy of, of humans at first was probably the earth was flat. The thing is, when somebody gets it in their head and they want to study something or they observe something that may be away from the status quo, then you have a situation where now things are being challenged. What you thought you knew was being challenged. So I think that's probably where it started to come from. So once it was figured out that the earth wasn't flat, I can see that uh, it probably caught on, uh, uh, you know, around a lot of people. But there were still some people that wanted to hold on to their theory that it was flat. So, you know, th this was an evolution between different groups of people at different times. As we can see in some of the information we presented, because even at the times when uh, people like Aristotle or uh, Aristotle and uh, Giovanni and uh, uh, um, Coriolis, when they were going through the uh, scientific method and put this time strong there was definitely a strong opposition uh, to say that uh, say otherwise. So I think it was just an evolution of a uh, talk uh, with people. It's just always been a little bit of back and forth where there was always a minority who thought the same. And I think that's what we're going through today. Even though this is for thousands of years, we are kind of still a bit of a research. There's still a bit of a, of a resurgence that's going on. Uh, you know, that's that, that's my piece. I, I ended on that. Okay, yeah. You know, I, I kind of agree with that. I think it's a bit of, uh, you know, um, conspiracy theories are really easy to get attached to. We have so many conspiracy theories that uh, we tend to lose reasoning and, and we, we misconstrue um, irrationality for logic because we want... To believe that there's a read there's an answer for everything some things you're just not going to get an answer for and the unknown is just going to be left unknown there are not going to be things that you're just going to uh, have access to um, because it may be peculiar or things like that that's what makes science so important because science answers things in a way to say we just don't know science isn't about knowing everything it's about accepting the unknown and leaving it where it is until there are tools and information to be able to dispute it and send it through a rigorous testing system. Until then, things are better yet left with the, where they are. Because if you don't have valid proof of it, what are you really arguing? So that, that's, that's my question when I ask the brothers on the panel, and of course this is open, if it's beyond the scientific method and you have no proof, what are you really arguing? Mm. And I'll leave the open that's yeah. the panel. Yeah, that, that was my main point about the flat earth. It's like I've never heard any uh, astronomer or physicist or uh, anybody in aerodynamics speak on the earth being flat. So um, the consensus, all say that the Earth is round. So anybody outside of it would be like a quack conspiracy theorist. I haven't seen anyone uh, with any kind of uh, with any kind of uh, study in any kind of uh, field that would agree that the Earth is flat. Until I see something like that, then I might give it a listen. But I don't even listen to <laughs> most of the flat Earth theorists. Because, I mean, it's been debunked in the 1500s. So why would we be still going 
going after something that's 500 years old or rebringing it up. Uh, only only thing, uh, like Consul mentioned earlier, would be uh, people that just have an affinity for conspiracy. That's just what they want. I mean, everything has to be wrong, um, from from shootings to uh, terrorist attacks to everything. Every, uh, presidential election, that always a conspiracy behind something. So that would even include the Earth being round of flat. Yeah, that's powerful, brother. I totally agree. I think that is irrational. One thing I will say is, why is it so hard to be a happy human being? What choice do you have? You know, audience, ask yourself that question. What choice do you have but to be happy through all the strife? What are you going to do about it? Let me ask a question to the panel. Let's say the earth is flat. Now, what, is, what does that got to do for our present situation in the state of Maine? What does that do for us? Now the earth is flat. We've been lied to. Next. So what does that mean? Where do we go from there? We just found out the earth is flat, guys. We were wrong. Now where do we go from here? Bills bills still got to be paid regardless, right? Kids got to eat, man. Exactly. Very lazy. No? Um, Is it going to advance the human species? Absolutely not. I feel like, you know, in, in that mindset right there, it keeps us in ignorance. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and, and even, like, I, I would like to touch back on the religious thing. Like, you know, people take those, like, I guess people, some people won't accept the earth being round because of whatever of religious text. But, you know, those those are esoteric writings, you know what I'm saying, written in allegory. Like, those weren't meant to be taken li- literally, you know what I'm saying? So... Some people won't will feel like this is the word of God. It can't be wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's wrong, you know. It is what it is. <laughs> I don't. So I mean, even even when we look at the paradox here, we look at the foundation of this being a flat Earth. When we see what was behind the arguments, be it round versus flat it's a lot more political than it is necessary Mm -hmm. because we're still studying the earth there's a lot of things about the earth we don't know that doesn't stop us from doing what we do and the earth doing what is it does Mm -hmm. and and i think that's what is not really uh spoken of when those argue flat earth and the ones that argue flat earth it just has to be it's a level of relativity because you have absolutely no scientific method to prove that it's a flat earth. Well, we, would, we wouldn't even have GPS. You know what I'm saying? GPS is a testament to the earth being round. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know, there's a few things that we could use that's just really smoking guns for the earth not being flat. Um, I think we just took the, the real scholarly approach to do it this time. You know, we kind of, you know, we didn't really hit them with the antagonistic thing or we didn't really put some you know some real stuff on them it also makes a valid point the fact that gps exists that already disproves that the earth is flat because if you understand how gps works there's no way the earth could be flat for it to work exactly. you know you have, to, you have to understand satellites and how they uh triangulate the position relativity is very relativity you know yeah in order to give you a precise measurement of where to go and, and and how far it is, you know, this, that, and the other. <clears throat> so, I mean, that there's a lot I know for a fact. I know we all know on this, on, on this show that there's a lot more things we could have covered to show that the Earth is not flat. I mean, there were a bevy of things we could have talked about. We could have talked about the fact that airplanes fly in a great circle route. They don't fly straight from point to point because it wouldn't mm-hmm. be possible it wouldn't be possible on the earth that's spherical. You cannot fly from point to point on a spherical earth. You would never go to where you're supposed to go if you were trying to go point to point. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's one of many topics we could we could have covered. But we, we took the family road, and we show how long that it's been known that the earth has been spherical. And even in, some, in certain cases, the challenges that these people encountered bringing the information to people you know, they were also resistant when they brought this stuff up. So, you know, hopefully we put the topic to bed. 
but you know, as with most pseudo claims, they're gonna still linger around. But we've done our piece to show that uh, the Earth is definitely not flat. Yes, most definitely, man. I think it was a great, you know, I think we did what we always do. You know, we, we put the information out there. You know, everyone that's listening, like, comment, and subscribe. If you have comments about this, man, feel free, even if they're critical or against what we talk about. That's not the point. Um, we have no problem discussing this on a critical level. Uh, this is what we found uh, to be factual uh, and consensus. We don't see anything beyond logic to confirm that the earth is round we everything be, within logic really confirms to us that the earth is round everything else seems a bit irrational and illogical and not and it's inconsistent that's the biggest factor it doesn't anything personal because honestly as human beings juxtaposed to this planet if it was a triangle it is not going to affect us to be honest because we are byproducts of our atmosphere and our and this um, geology called the planet. This, this ecology, this ecosphere, we are already accustomed to. We are built within it. We are organisms that are built within it. So if it is what you say it is, it's not going to change the price of tea in China. It's not. And if you don't have logical data, you're really wasting your brain matter trying to prove it. It's really futile. You're not going to really prove anything. Before we close out, any closing statements that anybody on the squad, on the team wants to make, I'll play, feel free. I'm, I'm good. You know, peace to the team. Peace to everybody that's listening. You know, definitely, you know, everybody came and gave a great presentation. You know what I'm saying? And just, you know, think about what's most important, man. Them kids, man. Here, just like Kansu said, man, and let's say the earth was flat. What is it going to change, man? Bills still got to be paid. Kids got to be fed and taught. You know? That's that's real talk, man. And this is why we love science, man. It keeps us rational. You know, we're regular average, average guys. We're not claiming to be big-time scholars. We're not claiming to be the smartest cats in the world. We're claiming is that science gives you the ability to judge things with proper perspective. And it's always about expanding your perspective and your intelligence while you live in this particular situation. So we appreciate everybody that tuned in. Make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to Team Osiris YouTube, Team Osiris Facebook, Team Set. Like, comment, and subscribe. Team Osiris Rises. Do all of that, man. Myself, Kansu Sheshmo Amun, my man Melvin, my man Joseph, my man Heru, my man Menace, my man Chris, my man Tristan, we call him Triz, my man Her Hero, my man Higgs Boson, my man, of course, my brother Khufu, and of course, our brother Ngozi, Gaisi Ngozi, man, to all the brothers in Team Osiris, we got many more if I missed you. Now, for Kyle with Team All Set, we, we appreciate all y'all. So with that being said, have a good night. Be peaceful and be prosperous. We out.